Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I apologize. I am still struggling from something called hay fever I picked up in London. <laughs> so I apologize for my voice, but thank you. And before we get started, I just want to give a shout out to all the sponsors. Without them, these dreaming events don't happen. So thank you to all the sponsors. If you guys haven't had a chance, check them out. Go to the booth. Uh, I'm, seriously, these are the people that make these conferences happen. So without further ado, um, we are here. Hopefully you're in the right room. We're going to talk about requirements, discovery, what it all means. My name is Pallavi Agarwal. I am from DC. I grew up in DC. And uh, just a little bit about me. I've been a consultant for life. Um, they talk about ac accidental admins. I am an accidental consultant. And <laughs> I've stayed in that forever. And through my consulting years, being able to just see the different things. And then a couple years later, I thought I was crazy. Let's start a company. So now I run my own consulting firm in the Salesforce ecosystem. But that's just a little part of me. I also enjoy biking, traveling, hiking, snowboarding, waiting for snow force to come through. And um, I also sit on a board for Witness Success, which is another dreaming event, as well as the DC Admin Lead. So as we get started, um, just so you guys know a little bit about me and my journey and why I talk about requirements, why it's so important today. Um, like I said, I've been a consultant all my life. I started at Accenture by accident in 2005 and just stuck with consulting since then. I have seen it all. I have done um, SAP implementations, Oracle CPQ, Java Custom, PeopleSoft, financials, you name it, I've done it. It's, I've customized it. I've worked in supply chain. I've worked in the finance industry. I've worked in networking industries. So very in, industry agnostic, software agnostic, tool agnostic. I really focus on the functional side, the business side of things. So a little journey. I really thought I was going to be done with consulting in 2011. So I took a break, tried out some, I got an MBA and tried out to check out the studios, the Hollywood life, realized, no, I miss consulting. So then I came back into consulting, but started doing more startup consulting. And that's really where I got introduced to the cloud space. Because there was this something called cloud at that time. It was really taking off. Prior to that, I had been in federal consulting, and the government doesn't really trust the cloud yet. So I was still focused more on the ERPs back then. And through the cloud space is how I got introduced to CRMs, and then eventually to Salesforce. So we're here to talk about discovery. Um, a lot of people tend to define discovery in different ways. The way we're going to baseline the conversation for today is post-sales. So what is the discovery? Like once we've made the sale and we're ready to put a project together and implement something for our customers, what does that discovery look like? Which really is the requirements gathering piece. And so I'm going to pause there and see if anyone has, I, and I love to have this be a more of an interactive session than me just talk at you, because again, these are all just my personal opinions. Um, so it does, can anyone define discovery for me? Trish? Sorry, I think I'm supposed to use this. Can you say it one more time? Listening to the client until you truly and honestly understand what the client needs. OK. Anyone else? Nothing to add around discovery? So in my opinion, it's listening to the clients enough to say, no, we don't do that. <laughs> OK. That's fair. If you could pass the mic back. Yeah, also, to uh, add what the lady in front row said uh, is that you have to look past what the client is saying and look at what the client actually needs. So sometimes the client think uh, he or she needs something, but actually is looking, focusing too much on the steps and the process instead of on the results, and that there's a better way to do it. Awesome. Well said. All right. So we're actually going to touch base on everything you guys said, because everything people talked about with discovery is accurate and true. So, but first, before we get into discovery and what it really is, some of the things we need to consider is what are the things we need to do when it comes to discovery, right? We need to first identify the goals. Why are we even sitting in a conversation to talk about discovery? And what are the type of questions we're looking to answer? 
That one is really more focused, again, not on the solution we're trying to implement, but the business problems we're trying to solve. So when you're taking care of discovery, always keep the business in mind first, because at the end of the day, Salesforce or any other application is just a tool to help them accelerate their business. So when we talk about identifying the goals, we want to look at the smaller goals and the broader goals, right? Like the smaller goals might be, I need, my, I need our users to, to input data faster. Right now it's on spreadsheets, it's all over the place, we want one place to do that. And a broader goal might be, we're looking to increase our revenue by X percent in the next three years, or we're looking to be a market leader and this is our horizon. So looking at the horizon goals as well as the immediate goals is very important. Along with that, once you identify your goals, you also want to think about how are you going to measure the success of what you're doing. So having very clear, tangible, measurable goals is very important. So if we talk about we want to increase revenue by X percent, putting an actual number to that X, and then over time looking at did we actually help meet that goal? Did we help our users input the data faster if we were planning to reduce time by two hours? Were we able to do that or were we only able to reduce it by an hour? So having those measurable goals is really important to the discovery and the success of it all. Along with that, yeah, sorry? How do you guide your clients to actually spend more, right? Hold on one second, they're gonna yell at me otherwise. So what I find when inviting a client to make a metric tangible, mm -hmm. they are scared to make it tangible because either they don't know what their current business as usual is, yep. or they feel scared because if they make it tangible, their head gets cut, cut off after it's <laughs> delivered and it's not that metric. Right. So making it more realistic, right? Making sure the goals that are tangible are actually realistic goals. Like me coming to the team and if we're implementing our internal org and saying, I want to do this to increase 50% revenue. I can say that's my goal, but is that a realistic goal or not? That's where you know a lot of the analytics also comes into the place and knowing the business really well helps is no, actually 50% doesn't seem like it's realistic. How about we shoot for 10% or 15%? Giving them that comfort level that the goals that you're putting together are something that are attainable. And making sure they don't have to be big goals. They can be small goals too, as long as they're attainable and achievable and tangible. So continuing on that question, I'm a client, so, so I, I sit more on, on the business side. And one of the things that I find with when you embark on these kind of journeys, they're, they're usually they're large uh, scale implementations. They have those, those goals that are usually articulated in business cases are mm -hmm. very high level goals, like we want to uh, get X amount of revenue. In reality, X amount of revenue is something that you get after two years. Right. So what are your advices around building up different hierarchies of, mm -hmm. of success measurements of, so if you want to get X amount of revenue, that means that you need to, need to do this amount more uh, opportunities, you have to, to have this amount of more uh, activities mm -hmm. that you can start track, tracking earlier on and that you can get baseline data for yeah. rather than just sticking to one goal and you know um, having people question the success before it even had the opportunity to get there. Yeah so you'll have that big tangible goal like okay this is our horizon goal but then you need to have those project milestones along the way that are your mini goals leading you there. So kind of like if I'm going on a long road trip, my destination is this, but the pit stops along the way are the other measurements that lead up to that. So it's still on that route. So for example, on the revenue piece, right? Let's say we had a goal of let we want to increase the revenue by 100, 100 million by year in the next two years. Then we'll probably want to break that down and put a quarterly revenue goal knowing that the first two quarters, because there's user adoption to take care of and learning curves and so on and so forth, the first two quarters might be less revenue. It's not just gonna be divided by eight. Figuring those out and then measuring across and then also having, it's a discussion, not just a here's what we're doing. 
So having those discussions and having rules set that, okay, our revenue is 100 million, we're gonna track our quarters, but we may need to adjust this goal as we get more real-time data to say, okay, 100 million is actually not what we thought it should be, it should be 50 million based on what we're seeing, or hey, we're already surpassing our goal, maybe we were too, too conservative with our goal and we need to raise it. So having those checkpoints along the way helps, and breaking it down, that is definitely a key to large transformation projects. Thank you. So outside of identifying the goals, one of the other things is like identifying who the stakeholders are especially in large transformation projects, it's not just gonna be that one individual that you're working with to get all the requirements, right? Sometimes when I'm in implementations from major transformations, you have the finance department, you have the marketing department, you have IT, you also have the C-suites having their own ver versions of their goals. So figuring out who the stakeholders really are from different angles. So it's not just one stakeholder or a group of stakeholders, it can be siloed stakeholders as well. So finance might have a revenue goal that they need to hit based on this project. Marketing may have a different goal. IT may have a, role, a goal of reducing tech, tech debt, right? And so thinking about all those different goals and how do we as a whole take this project and help achieve those goals in different ways is also something to consider. Now I've talked about more on the high level for stakeholders, but also there's a key stakeholder in this that a lot of us forget to consider when we're sitting in those meetings with the decision makers, which is the end users. So also keeping in mind the end users as a stakeholder, and again, the marketing team end user is gonna use the system in a different way than a finance team versus the IT team, so also taking that into consideration is very important. That's where RACI, I don't know if you guys have heard of that, but RACI comes into play, is as you're looking at different goals and different conversations of the requirements you're gathering, who's the responsible person, who's the accountable person, who's contributing and who just needs to stay informed because they might be impacted by it. Taking that into consideration and really doing that is gonna make a huge impact. I can tell you when I started in Accenture, I was working on a huge supply chain project and it was actually the global supply chain for Department of State. And we built it, built it, built it, sitting with the users in the room. We got to UAT, and the real users who use the system came in, and almost every one of them was like, this isn't how we do our job. <laughs> and we were like two months from go live. So having to take that step back and be like, oh my gosh, we missed this whole bucket of stakeholders, that's why like, having the users involved from day one at whatever degree is very important. Let me give you the mic real quick. There's actually one more uh, group to add, or two. Uh, not just end users, but also the customers and partners. So mm -hmm. the external stakeholders, yep. they're also often forgotten. Yep. Especially if they directly interact with your system like through uh, partner portals, so the experience cloud, yep. Salesforce uh, for uh, partners and also for customers, then it can be even more challenging to keep track of what they would like. Yeah, no, that's very important, especially if it is an external system. Some of ours has been more internal where the customers are just using it internally. But when we do talk about building portals with our stakeholders, we have to think about them as well. So. Thank you for bringing that to the point, because that is a group that we want to make sure. Can we pass the mic that way? Um, I just want to um, um, go further on the fact that you built something, and in the end, the end users don't, don't want to have that. Yeah. I think now, now um, today, that won't happen anymore, I think, because yeah, most companies and consulting companies don't use waterfall uh, method, methodology anymore. So in an agile uh, way of working, yeah, in the first sprint, uh, normally you should already see something in the end. Yeah, you'd be surprised. Like we, yeah, yeah, we yeah. use the agile methodology <laughs> and <laughs> our users don't always bring the right people to the table to test it either. So yeah, <laughs> we use the agile approach because no one's figured out agile yet. So. <laughs> Can I just say from an agile, I think uh, when agile came out, it was done properly in the sense of it didn't mean don't document, don't analyze. Right. It meant as quickly as possible build something to test what yep. you're being told. 
it became, don't bother with all that documentation and analysis, just build it, right. we can always change it. And that's the problem. I, I agree with you yeah. if it was done the way it was originally conceived, but most people don't do it that way. And yes. so it's hybrid, it's hybrid it's, is what it's yeah. become. So. The, as I like to call it, the agile approach. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so I mean, thank you, Richard, because that's a segue into our next piece, right? Documentation is still the key. As much as we are in the agile world, documenting and putting the playing field in one place, leveling it, is really important. One of the things we have found with documentation is we might sit in a room and talk about the same thing and everyone's like, yeah, 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 but then when you write it out, they're like, wait, that's not what I thought it was, even though everyone was in agreement. So having that documentation, having those visuals, really helps everyone understand and get the baseline of what we're trying to accomplish. One of the things, uh, as an example, I'm just going to make it up, is um, we're all talking about X. Everyone walks away. Everyone's like, yes, it was X. And then the next day, we put the documentation on, at the table. And they're like, oh, but I thought X was this which is really why, and we're like, no, we're talking about X. So that's where documentation really is the key to helping ensure we're all speaking the same language, we're all understanding it the same way as much as possible, and then taking it next step further. All right, so once we have those things, how do we become successful, right? It's a very, very hard question. That's why there's two slides on this. Um, one is like the big thing is ask why. Right? <laughs> ask why. It's just that simple. And be like, you know, in, growing up in America, there was a joke of like being the annoying kid that would just ask, but why, but why, but why? But honestly, that is the best thing to do when it comes to requirements. I cannot tell you how many times we sit in requirement sessions with our clients and two, three hours later, it's like, that's what you were asking for? Oh my gosh, I thought we were talking about this the whole time and it's because we kept peeling the onion and just kept asking the whys to get to the bottom of it. So they really wanted a, they said they wanted a yellow apple. Turns out they just wanted a banana. They thought they wanted a yellow apple but it was just as simple as a banana. So, you know, things like that is so important and the key to everything. Also, like I mentioned earlier, understanding different goals of stakeholders, right? What is this person looking to do? What is this person looking to accomplish from a user level versus an executive level? Because everyone's using the same system. The data does matter. And, you know, how, how is everyone interpreting the data? How is the person inputting the data for the person to interpret the data? All of that. But what is the end goal from a business perspective, right? We can put the data. We can interpret it. But what are we really trying to achieve from it? If you ask the CEO, he's looking at ways to increase the, um, the expansion of the company, maybe, or like talk to the stakeholders or his investors to be like, look, we, uh, we're year over year by 100%. This is what we've been able to do, or things like that. Whereas if you talk to the CTO, he's looking at the technical debt and how much, how much the system's working, what's integrated, how is everything working. You're looking at the CMO, they're looking at a different aspect. But then you're looking at the users and they're like, I'm just keying in this information, right? But they, if we don't help understand that whole cycle and understand what everyone's key roles are, what they're doing to help connect the dots, then again, you can build a house. No one wants to live in it. It's kind of use, useless. So, <laughs> you know, think about that. Also know that in requirement sessions, and we talked about listening to our customers and really understanding what they want. But it's also that second piece, not just listening, but understanding what they want. So there's constant learning on both ends because they don't know what they don't know. That's why they hire the experts with the systems, but they do know their business really well. So it's also our job to listen and understand their business in order to relate the tools back to their business. Another thing is road mapping. Um, one, you know, this goes back to the agile approach. Don't and the MVP methodology, right? So we talk to our customers about building the mansion, but let's start maybe with like a single family house or an apartment and then, but let's have the foundation that the mansion can be built. We just don't need to build it all at once. So that's where road mapping is really the key and why it comes into place because our customers like, we talk in our, in our discovery, we always talk utopic state. 
we want to know anything and everything because if we don't, then there's we're building here and then a few months later, a year later, they're like, but we also wanted this. It's like, I wish I had known because we would have designed the foundation a different way. So discovery, keep it at the utopic. Ask for anything. It's your Christmas wish list or you know, your utopic state, and then scale it down. Then look at the MVP approach of, okay, now that we understand the world that you're looking for, here's the one country we think we should build or a state. We'll get there, and here's the roadmap on how we'll get there. So they also can, from a customer perspective, understand that journey, their investments from a long-term perspective, but also have those milestones to know that, okay, we're on the right track if we're achieving these things. Let me get the mic to you. Yeah, I think the second point is also uh, critical here. So understand the big picture. Like like you said, it's the Christmas wish list. We want to know everything to um, be aware of the the big picture and to also make the foundation fit that. And the metaphor I often use is that uh, when customers think too isolated, they only think like in siloed compartments that you cannot expect to stack a thousand sheds and end up with a skyscraper. It doesn't work like that. You have to look at the big picture. And uh, what also comes to into play here that's uh, with sales projects, uh, we often st know already that we start with Salesforce. So we dr dive straight into the solutioning without yeah. actually looking uh, what the big picture should look like if we completely ignore Salesforce, if we look at it completely system agnostic, technology agnostic, right. like what is actually the requirement for the business process and should the business process even sit in Salesforce or should, should it be an ERP system or in an HR system or anything like that. Yep. And that's, uh, that's what people often forget and then end up with something that doesn't scale anymore because it, it's actually a thousand siloed steps that were just right. stacked together instead of something that was designed start to end. Exactly, and thank you. I think you're stealing some of my presentation right <laughs> 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 uh, No, but like that's why our discovery, we have a cardinal rule. We don't talk about technology. Our discovery is technology agnostic, and we still have our solution architects, technical architects sit on those calls to listen in because they do need to know what's possible, what's not possible, because to your point, we can't always do everything. It's not a magic software, right? Um, it can do a lot, but it's not magic. So we always talk about, let's talk about the business and the business needs. What do you really need? And then we break it down further is what is nice to have and what is a critical right away to help us also define those MVPs and the milestones because not everything needs to be built right away, but also why do you need it for your business? Not just because, oh, I heard this buzzword. I remember one of our clients at a very big financial institution was like, Pulvi, let's, let's start using chatbots. I just heard about this at a, co a conversation. They're talking about chatbots. I'm like, yeah, but we need to build a knowledge base first. And she's like, what's that? I'm like, exactly, let's put chatbots on hold for now, right? So also understanding the whys and what is it because you know, Salesforce or any other product does a great job marketing the features that they have, but it's not necessary that those features are key to the customer you're working with. So, yes, can we pass them? Yeah, them. yeah me. Um, I just wanted to quickly go back to the why. I, the reason I'm, I'm going back there is um, I had a colleague, oh, I have a colleague who asked the client why, and the client was like, is that all you have to ask? <laughs> and he caught the call, you know? So how do you ask the why? When is the why a problematic <laughs> why? And things like that. Yeah, I mean, I don't just say why to our customer, right? <laughs> <laughs> To be fair, but I say, you know, like just, uh, just having probing questions. Like, you know, doing discovery is being a bit like a detective to really get to the bottom of everything. So asking, okay, we're tr what are we trying to achieve? That's like one of the first questions I ask. All right. Why are we trying to achieve it? What is our goal in the end? What are some of the things we're looking for? Yeah. Wait, let me get you the mic. No worries. <laughs> so you, you first thought of asking, why do you exist? Right? Why, why are we here? And if they can't answer that question, then you're Yeah, good. yeah, definitely. These are all great points. Um, so 
so talking through all of that, like I'm not going to read through all of this, but I mean, the gist of it is ask a lot of probing questions. Really try to understand what is their current process, where are they trying to go. So we do a lot of current state to future state as well. And that's where the road mapping ties in, as well as what is, what is the nice to have, what is the key. We've had customers come to us with documents this big saying, we've done our discovery. And I'm like, great, we're still going to do discovery. Don't worry. And they're like, no, 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 we don't need to pay for this. Because that's another part, right? How do you convince someone to pay for this? Because it is so, in a way, intangible. You're not getting a product out of it because discovery is just conversations. So trying to convince them. So you know, we say, OK, let's just do a quick validation of what you're telling us is what we understand as well. So we change the dialogue in that way. And they're like, OK, yeah, we d definitely want you to understand. So then we do our discovery. And within an hour or so of the conversation, as we're going through it, they'll be like, wait, we didn't think about this. But they had spent months doing their discovery, right? And it, it go I'll come back to you in a second. But it goes back to because you know what you know and you're good at what you are at. Having a fresh perspective helps probe questions in different ways that you may not have thought about. So it's not necessarily bad that their discovery, the amount that they spend, is time wasted or anything. It's just more a fresh perspective always helps with that. Thank you. So we are where we are because as, in, as humans, we adapt to situations that we're faced with. We find solutions. We find you know middle ground or band-aid solutions and that ends up with an organization or a system or anything. One of the things that I challenged that I found with understanding the big picture when you go in from, from an implementation point of view or, or any, any strategy point of view is that even if you, if you say we're not going to talk about technology, if you don't talk about you know, business architecture first, so really understand uh, an organization from the capability level up and let the organization articulate their own and identify their own capabilities and then later tie questions back to those business capabilities. It's really difficult to, to try to um, both identify where they are in the journey and where they want to go is in terms of you know, those, those wish lists. Yep. But also, you know, why they need to pay for certain things. How do you how, on that on that capability discovery? How do you how do you start painting that picture? Because that can be a quite um, it's it's challenging. challenging. It's sticker yeah. shocking, and it's like, oh my god, what did I sign up for? Right. Um, so a lot of it is doing some research prior. Right. Remember when we started this conversation? I said the deal has already been sold, and we're doing an implementation. Um, we're doing an implementation. So that being said, sorry, there we go. Hopefully it comes back on. My computer's taking a vacation without, without me. So, um, so having to do that assessment in advance, right, before that pre-sale, like, before that sale in the pre-sale part is understanding the landscape, the, the business architecture as well, and the capabilities to size the project. But if you're doing it in the middle of discovery, I'm not saying don't talk about technology in that aspect. When I say technology is like, we'll have users come into the conversation and be like, I want a pick list. I want this auto-filled. And we're like, don't design it for us. We'll help you design it. We just want to understand your requirements. But when it comes to that architectural layout of the different applications and the plugs, plug and plays of the different connects, that's definitely important and an important part of discovery. I think as someone else mentioned, it's Salesforce might not always be the right answer, right? Or certain tools might not be the right answer. You also want to figure out where's the source of truth? Where are we keeping the master data? How are we flowing it and keeping it? very, very tight in that aspect. We're not having duplicate records in multiple applications as well. So you also have to do that kind of assessment. And in regards to technology, we should definitely talk about it that way. The regards to technology we should not talk about is how to design the system in the, in the conversations. Awesome. Yes. Oh, yeah, I know. Let's see if I can do that. I might start from the beginning. OK, perfect. Um, Yes. So
So, like you say, we don't want users to design a solution. Mm -hmm. But equally, I've been in discoveries where somebody has a specific idea of how they want something to work, or maybe they've worked somewhere previously, particularly if they've had Salesforce, and then had debates with other consultants about whether it's appropriate to ask them. Now, in my opinion, it was appropriate to say to the person, well, tell us what that did and how it worked. And then we can understand why and what you're trying to achieve. But actually, if you worked and used something and it worked really well, yeah. why not us try and understand, you know? So what was that? What did it look like? How did it, what data did it pick up? Like, try and get out of them as much as they can. Is that okay? Yeah. I mean, again, it all goes back to what is right for the customer and their experience and their journey, their adoption, all of that. So going back to if they are to a certain degree, they're like, we've seen this, it works, we want that, understanding why they want that and what it is. Because that might not be the solution, but you might be like, okay, we know what you want, here's how we can do it as well. So it's getting back to that why. Exactly. And then also maybe understanding like, well, were there any pain points with it? So right. if they say, yeah, actually it didn't do X, you can be like, okay, so what were you trying to achieve? How can we almost go one better than what you're talking about. Yeah, because it goes back to, they don't always know what they know in terms of the technology. So something they might think is the right solution and they're doing it, it might be to, that's just how they learned it, so they think it's the right way. Whereas once we get to the bottom of it, you're like, oh wow, you're really doing it the complicated route. Let me show you the easier way, right? And, and vice versa, it could be like, actually, that works. Let's see how we can implement it. It's not always that they're, they're their solutions are complex or they don't know, but it's guiding and having that back and forth conversation and not having it one way. All right, so um, the other things, I know you guys can read through it, but like, you know, one of the other things is like really trying to make sure, going back to the agile process, and I keep pointing to Richard because I think you said that so well, is as you're moving along with that journey and whatever you can build, because sometimes visuals are the key, you can theorize everything in a conversation and agree to it, write it out in a perfect documentation until they start seeing the application. And the more they see the application, the more like, oh, what about this also? So it helps keep that conversation going. So again, constant learning is on our end too, as well as the customers. So being able to adapt, change, and try it, fail, try, fail, and that's completely okay. That is accepted, and that's what, why we do lots of iterations and cycles to get to the bottom of it. So also keep that in mind. Other things are you know, just making sure, like we were talking about the big goals and then how to create those strategic smaller goals to move along the timeline. Also give them validations along the way that everything we're discussing, it makes sense and it's being built. And then, questions, right? Like we've talked about this as a group already, is like, what are the goals we're trying to meet? What are the pain points we're trying to solve for? Why are we even doing this? You know, why are we investing as a customer millions of dollars in this big transformation? We need to understand that. Why? What are we trying to get out of it? How is this going to help the long-term scalability approach as well, right? We didn't talk about that in the previous slides, but that's very key too, is making sure as you're talking about the utopic state, we're not talking about just one incident or two. We're talking about a process that flows and continues to grow in long-term approach. Because that's another place where the 80-20 rule comes into play is as we're going through discovery, I don't know how many times you guys have had this, but we've always had at least one person in the room being like, no, but I have to have this. This is critical to the business. Okay, please explain why. And then they explain it and it sounds like, okay, yeah, it sounds very critical. How many times does this happen? Well, it happens once a year, but we have to change the way we build a system to incorporate for this, right? That's where the 80-20 rule comes into play is figuring out your trade-offs is, is it that critical and it only happens once a year that we need to incorporate the solution around it or is there a workaround that's manageable until we can get to a longer term solution and yes, it might be manual and painful, but because it's happening once a year, the trade-off is still better to design the system the other way. So keeping that in mind, not only asking why, but also how often 
we have found it to be very useful. One second, I don't know where the mic is. <laughs> yeah, I think one uh, important thing to keep in mind there, though, is that you uh, shouldn't just look at the frequency something is used, but also the impact. Mm -hmm. And that's also where I see some uh, issues with the prioritization methods used in many forms of Agile, uh, which is mostly uh, uh, the story point method, which focuses too much on how much effort it takes to build something and not enough, in my opinion, on uh, how much impact it has, how much val value it provides, but especially how much um, risk it takes away. And what I like there is the uh, sk skilled agile framework, the safe uh, method of um, uh, way that assures job first, where you really bring it down to one number that combines the effort it takes uh, with the opportunity enablement and the risk reduction to get, because it might occur only once a year, but if that's once a year uh, and not dealing with it would mean that right. the whole company would topple over. Exactly. Then it's definitely something you want to look at. Right, yeah, <laughs> no, it's definitely the <laughs> impact analysis you have to do on those as well, right? Of And again, in terms of the discovery point, that's in those conversations, all of that should be uncovered. If you're asking the right questions, you'll also realize the significance of that process or that task and then be able to determine whether, even though it's a, in, in the 20 rule, it's still significant enough that we need to incorporate it, or no, it's definitely something manageable that as a business we can continue to take this pain point on because the significance or the risk impact is not there. Yeah, yeah another yep. key factor there is, uh, are there any workarounds? So maybe you don't want to build it in the system as like a really yep. nice exactly. uh, process that's uh, fully uh, worked out end to end, but if there's some manual workarounds, then yeah, it's manageable. Exactly, exactly. And that's where we do a lot of process mapping as well to go through and then identify what are, what are today manual that we can maybe automate, what are today manual that we're gonna keep manual as a business decision and continue to iterate on that because a transformation is not an overnight thing. It is called a transformation because it takes years at time to get to the end goal. So taking that into consideration as well. And some of it is also us educating our customers who are going through this journey with us that we're on this journey together for a while. It is not gonna be overnight. You're not gonna get everything the next day and helping them understand it, but also showing them the value along the journey to have them sit in that car with you for the next three years, right? Like they don't wanna jump jump out yet <laughs> so wanting to uh, and that goes back to having the milestones understanding the real discovery of what is their business what are they trying to accomplish what is their end goal and then what are we going to do to show them like we're almost there we're almost there and they're seeing that value add being being brought on sir in the back if you could get the mic yeah so yeah, really good discussion. Uh, I just wanted to add something to that. Yeah. Uh, we also use uh, discovery uh, to build uh, the business case. Um, it's something that you should really try to uh, do. Um, you don't have to do it yourselves. You, you can involve people there from mm -hmm. the business. Uh, we have had very good experience with that because mostly you know, there is some kind of budget that comes out of the air. Uh, and then within that budget, they expect a lot of things, like you're saying, a whole journey. Well, probably the budget is not sufficient for that. If you build the business case, people start to figure out, wow, I mean, what value can we actually get if we improve our service operation? Right. Uh, and then they have, let's say, an, uh, uh, an old system uh, doing the service operation and they want to uh, change it, for example, from a cost center to uh, a profit center, right. Yeah, then the picture totally changed. Then it's not about, okay, we invest, I don't know, half a million. I mean, we, we have had now the situation that they allocate a half a million, and then from the business case, they could easily inve invest five million or, yep. or 10 million in it and still make a huge return. Right. Um, and I think, just going forward, this, if you forget this step, then you end up talking to IS the whole time, and IS has a certain budget, 
uh, and that's what, what you then have to do. It's not really bring the value that you right. wanted to bring. Yeah. And 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 that and that's a terrible situation, of course. And, uh, yeah. No, thank you, you for adding that yeah. point. That's very true. The, the the return on investment, the the value is at the end of the day part of that why, right? They're investing this money to get something in return. So constantly focusing on that as well and ensuring and having those validations along your journey to be like, are we meeting these goals? Are we helping achieve this? Or are we just draining the budgets? Because I've unfortunately also had to take on some projects that didn't go so well from previous consulting firms and implementations. And the clients are now like, we have spent over $100,000. We've not seen anything in the last year. And now we're trying to catch up. And then it's like, but can you tell us the why? And they're like, we've already talked about the why. And I'm like, yes, but not in a way that we need it to give you what they need. And then slowly showing them the value that their why, even if it's repetitive, is creating by doing that agile approach of building something quickly, showing it, um, validating the documentation of what we've captured, are we understanding it, really helps. And then also pivoting to, okay, it might need an extra investment for some of the applications because Salesforce is a great tool, but we have to rely on a lot of our app exchange partners to help bridge the gap, right? So you might need this other application to help streamline your process, which is another investment that they might not have allocated for, but then showing them, okay, that investment is going to return in X hours saved or yeah. this and that, and that's the value. So thank you. All right, uh, anything else? Okay, so really quick, I always love, and you'll see this slide on every of my presentations because I love it because sadly, even in 2022, just three weeks ago, this just happened to me with a customer. So it never gets old. <laughs> so. So requirements are the key. Cannot design your system for you if I don't know your requirements. It's also on us to help ask the right questions, to help lead that journey, to get them there. But also thinking about the business first versus the technology helps to achieve the business goals, the business processes, the business vision. Also keeping the stakeholders in mind, making sure everyone that sits at the table in different aspects is feeling like value has been added for them. And the last bullet is super important. Let's never build short-term solutions. Let's build long-term that can be scalable, adjustable, you know, accessible, flexible. Flexible is also a big key. And ensuring that we do the best for our customers in that term. Awesome. All right, and once again, I want to thank all our sponsors. Again, these events would not happen without them. So thanks to all our sponsors. I'm going to just open the floor for any questions or comments. We have a few minutes left. The one thing, the one question I have around um, what you said about, you know, having those success metrics is if you're talking about hours saved, from an efficiency point of view, that works. If you talk about building effectiveness, so creating new capabilities for an organization. You often don't have a baseline for that. So if you've never been able to do something before, it's very difficult to gauge whether, you know, how successful you are in doing it now. What are your experience around hypothesis testing? So one of the things that, that we do without, we, that uh, we do in our transformation program is rather than saying we're going to get these goals, is that we're, we're, go we're, we're testing these hypotheses. So if we do this, we expect certain behaviors mm -hmm. or certain capabilities to change. And on, on that, we build confidence levels that we can later then build success metrics on. Have you had experience with that? And how, how, do, you, how do you use that in your consulting S practice? So I have seen more the hypothesis testing approach more with my European clients than my US clients for some reason. And because in my European clients, when we're doing big transformation, they do, they want the confidence up front. The, 
the lack of trust is a bit there. <laughs> so they're like, no, we want, we want to know this can be done. And it does help, but I think I've seen it fail multiple times as well because the hypothesis, again, whatever hypotheses we're formulating, everyone needs to have buy-in. And what I've noticed with a lot of our customers is when we do those hypothesis testing, there's already people in the room who are like, well, it's going to fail anyways. Let's go ahead and do it. So, you know, so it doesn't really work when everyone doesn't have buy-in. So coming up with the right way to define that hypothesis that helps get buy-in from everyone so they're in it to want to do it versus those who are already at the table wanting it to fail. Okay. But isn't the same thing true if you, if you, if you focus on outcomes? So, I mean, in this, in this market, if you've got a global, uh, if, you, if you come into a recession, your sales is going to drop. It's not, your, it, it's not your system's fault. It's not even your process fault. It's, it's the economy. Right. Right? But if, if you purely build outcome-driven targets, that's not, how do you, how do you create the, the, the room uh, or, or the flexibility in your, in your success metrics that you can attribute success or no success? Yeah, so two. we'll do two types of goals sometimes. Is like worst case scenario, these are the goals we're going to try to hit. Best case scenario, these are the goals we're going to try to hit. Also, the goals we set, we don't set them in silos. We look at the market trends and everything else going around, being like, is this really realistic? Because again, at the end of the day, we want to build realistic goals. Yeah and then try our best to achieve them. I'm, I'm four foot 11, if my goal is to be six feet, I'm never gonna get there, but it can be a goal of mine. So it's that, right, of building realistic goals that you, might be, that you know that you can, if you tried your best, you're gonna try to achieve them. Now, external factors play a role into that that you don't have control over, but that should also be part of the rules of engagement. That if we're setting these goals, we allow for flexibility, if external factors come into the play, I mean, that happened to all of us during the pandemic. No one was expecting that. So how do you adjust? So the, having that rule of engagement also that as things happen, we may need to adjust our goal, and it's not a rigid goal is what's going to be more successful. Okay. And my final question, and risk me hogging this microphone. <laughs> no uh, that you mentioned one thing in the beginning that I... I'm not really sure that you completely answered yet. Sorry. Um, it's a very common, something that I really commonly found. You, know, you talk about your requirements, you document your requirements, and you go out at a meeting, four people read the requirements, and four people think of something completely different, or they read something completely different. How do you document your requirements so that you cannot yeah. do that? So we're recording this, so the cat's out of the bag. Um, the secret behind me is I have zero certs. I don't build the system. And I do it on purpose. I stay functional close to the business. So when our team is writing those requirement documents, I actually try to read most of them because requirements is my passion. If I cannot understand them in layman's terms, we wrote it wrong. So we try to keep it, again, very technology agnostic, layman's term, business, simple. Companies call candor, keep it, keep it straightforward, right? Don't need to use big words and things like that. So if, I basically say, if I can understand it, I'm sure someone else can, but we actually have everyone read it and we do a session just to validate, are there any questions around this? Is everyone in agreement with this? And then we have every stakeholder sign off on it to get that buy-in again. And then we take that and we translate it into a solution, technical architect document of how we're gonna solution it and then we work on the build and do our iterations and MVPs and so on and so forth. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna stop giving uh, you guys the mic, uh, okay? There's <laughs> other people in the room. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and I think what also helps there is that uh, you don't just want a description, which can be more on a process level, more of a st storyline level, but open for interpretation. But then you combine that with acceptance criteria that are very mm -hmm. specific exactly. on what result you're looking for from each step, uh, and especially the, the final result, yeah. so that you have sort of an input-output matrix, and that the thing, in the thing you're designing should be sort of black box. You don't care how it works. It should, if this goes in, this should come out. Right. And if you write your acceptance criteria like that, it shouldn't be open for interpretation. 
exactly. We could talk about this for hours and do workshops on this as well. This is a very important topic, but fortunately I'm being told time is up. So, <laughs> but thank you everyone. And if anyone wants to discuss anything else, I'll be around. So thank you, thank you.